Unfortunately, I have had to allow for the fact that you cheated at your eye tests. You crept in here last night knowing you were going to have a medical, and you copied the eye charts onto your shoes. Wow, there's a throwback. I'm a competitive man, Crichton. That's what makes me what I am. We're all perfectly well aware of what you are, sir. So anyway, Rimmer was getting a health evaluation. Everything tickety-boo? And apparently the results aren't the best. Okay, so apparently Rimmer had high blood pressure due to stress when he was alive. Can't imagine why Rimmer would be stressed. And that somehow translated into his holographic form later on. I guess it's a mind over matter kind of thing. Honestly, it seems kind of dumb, but whatever. I'll just roll with it. And if you wish to avoid a gigantic electronic aneurysm, it is imperative that you start on a program of relaxation. So basically, Rimmer has to try to relax, and Crichton has something that could help him with that. Use these Chinese worry balls whenever you feel anxious or tense. I don't want the others to know about this. I want you to behave as if everything's absolutely normal. As you wish, sir. Meanwhile, Lister has found what's left of the simulant ship that they encountered in Gunmen of the Apocalypse, and Lister wants to loot it for supplies. Unfortunately, the ship is unstable, plus there could be surviving simulants on board. Look, we'll take our chances, man, okay? No K. However, Starbug is out of food supplies and they're living off moss and fungi that has been scraped off of passing asteroids. Meanwhile, while simulants don't need to eat, they keep food around so they can keep their human captives alive. In some cases, they've kept subjects alive for over 40 years in a state of perpetual agony. If we wanted to live in a state of perpetual agony, we'd let Lister play his guitar. Crichton, what's for dinner? Uh, tonight, sir, asteroidal lichen stew followed by dandelion sorbet. We're going in. Crichton thinks that Lister is being irrational, so Rimmer thinks that they should relieve him from duty and quotes a Space Corps directive. Any officer caught sniffing the saddle of the exercise bicycle in the women's gym will be discharged without trial. Sorry, sir, that doesn't quite get to the nub of the matter for me. That running joke is never going to get old. Anyway, Lister didn't want to say it in front of Cat, which is kind of precious. But Starbucks fuel tank got punctured at some point, so they're losing fuel and will probably run out of power in a few days. And then Rimmer has a panic attack. Grind those balls, sir! Grind them! Why does that sound so suggestive? So basically, they're most likely screwed no matter what they do, but if they board the simulant ship, there's a chance they'll get the supplies they need. After you with the balls, sir. Let's just pray the crew are rotting in silicon hell along with all the photocopiers. What's with a sudden prejudice against photocopiers? One of the suckers bumps into me, he'll be lunching on laser. So they board the ship and Kat's got his bazookoid at the ready. Unfortunately, they can't actually use them on the ship since the blast could cause it to blow up. Well, even a loud noise can start a ship quake. That's why I skipped chilies for breakfast. What do we do? Whisper, charge, tippy to up to them all screaming, shh, and chloroform them with Lister's armpits? Sounds like a plan to me. It turns out that there's a teleporter on the ship, which is going to come in handy. But they drop one of the crates and it causes a quake on the ship. And it turns out they're not alone. Well, if it isn't my old friends, the human vermin. However, they're basically at a stalemate because neither of them can shoot a weapon without blowing up the ship. As far as I cutted the range, ruthless killer simulants go. You're a bit of a babe. What are you doing tonight? Dying. But it turns out that she doesn't care about that, so they're back to being screwed. However, Rimmer is behind her and Lister tries to get him to attack her, and he's vague enough that she thinks he's talking to her. There is nothing for us to discuss. In 60 seconds you'll be dead. You can't be serious. Meanwhile, Rimmer finds an escape pod, and I think we all know where this is going. Rimmer activating the escape pod triggers a ship quake, so the rest of them get into the teleporter. Except that Crichton takes them back in time. Goodness sake, Crichton, don't you know how rude it is to burst in on an earlier version of yourself without warning? I'm very cross. Oops. Well, be you later. So now they're back on Starbug in the present time, and everyone escapes the ship just before it explodes. All in all, a hundred percent successful trip. Sir, we lost Mr. Rimmer. All in all, a hundred percent successful trip. So now Crichton tells them about Rimmer's stress problem. My escape plan worked then. So now, of course, Rimmer contacts them to gloat. I'm sure no one's forgetting the sheer manliness and stiff upper lipidness of the diversionary part of the plan. But it turns out that Rimmer has no control over the escape pod, and it's accelerating away from Starbug. Rogue simulants looted the pod from a colonization seeding ship. It is programmed to take you to the nearest planet with an S3 atmosphere. So Crichton tries to figure out how long it'll take him to get there. You should make planet fall in four days. But it involves going through a wormhole where time dilates. 
balls on standby, sir. Well, remember that medieval war, sir, that lasted quite a long time? The Hundred Years' War? Now take that figure and multiply it by six, and then you'll come up with your, your golden number, sir. So they're losing contact with Rimmer since he's getting too far away. Whatever befalls you, try and greet it with a smile on your lips and a song in your heart. You are a total, total, complete, utter, total, complete, total... You all enjoyed that a little too much. So basically for them it'll take a couple days to reach Rimmer, but for Rimmer it will have been 600 years. So Rimmer has reached the planet, so he explores it for a bit. The only life forms, the most basic single cell protozoa and me. Relationships would be difficult, but not impossible. It turns out there are rockets on the ship that are meant to accelerate growth, so he launches them. Six days later the whole planet goes from desert to forest. I had created Rimmer World. I was Adam in my own Eden, and only one thing was missing, my own Jane. Ah uh, yes, I remember the biblical story of Adam and Jane. Anyway, he somehow finds a way to clone a female version of himself. I'm not sure how he found his own DNA, but oh well. Technically, she would be my sister. After much soul searching, I reluctantly decided, what the hell, I just wouldn't tell her. Yeah, sounds like something you would do. Awkward. So Rimmer decides to try again, and that's the last we see of him for a while. Meanwhile, back on Starbug, the rest of the crew is reaching the planet, and naturally they're detecting life signs. Either Mr. Rimmer had the incredible good fortune to land on a populated planet, or... Or what? It's too hideous to contemplate. So they land, and... Hold the abomination! Rimmer! Silence! Travesty! Rimmer! Crichton's fears are confirmed. This might sound like a bit of a corny line, but I can't even bring myself to say it. Take us to your leader. Oh. Oh, could you? Hey, that's music from Meltdown. Dear Lord, what created such foulness? Is this the product of a marriage twixt woman and gerbil? We found them in the woods, your flared nostrilness. So it turns out that the leader is not Rimmer. At least not our Rimmer. Apparently the H is a symbol of power here, which is kind of ironic considering how much our Rimmer hates it. So, notice that there are masked women here, meaning that Rimmer must have eventually cloned female versions of himself. Yeah, that's not at all disturbing. <laughs> So anyway, being that everyone else on the planet is a Rimmer clone, the rest of the crew is seen as abominations, and they are being put on trial. Are there no signs of normalcy in these wretches? No cowardice or pomposity? No snidiness or smarm? Uh, sir, we wish to speak to the hologram known as Rimmer. I am he! I love the delivery of that line. How does the audience not react to it? Anyway, they are being sentenced to death, and it'll be carried out the next morning. Burn the bodies, then bring me the cold ashes on a silver plate, with a glass of chilled Sancerre. This guy's an animal. Doesn't he know it's red wine with cold ashes? So they're taken to a prison cell where the original Rimmer is being held, and he's still got those balls. I remember. Custer. Derek Custer. Kit. <laughs> Titan. It makes sense that after 557 years, he wouldn't remember their names exactly. You'd think he'd remember cats, though, unless maybe he's forgotten the names of all Earth animals. Which is possible, I guess. Thousands upon thousands of backstabbing, treacherous Judases. And they found out they couldn't damage my hard light drive. They locked me in here so I could never threaten their insane lust for power. Rimmer really is his own worst enemy. There's basically no way for Rimmer to get out, because the second one of the others found him, they'd throw him under the bus. Because Rimmer. The only way any society can evolve is through mutations in the gene pool. When there is no richness or variety, congenital disorders and inherited lunacy are commonplace. So not only is it a society of Rimmers, it's a society of insane Rimmers. There's gotta be a way out. But Lister has an elaborate plan. So that when a guard comes in, he gets laid out, and we put Rimmer in the guard's uniform, he leads us out and fights our way back to the bug. Or we could use the teleporter. That works too. So they teleport back onto Starbug, this time in the future. We're far more concerned at the moment about the quite hideous thing that's happened to Lister. I can't decide if that was a reference to the next episode or a coincidental random gag. And so ends Rimmer World. This episode was a lot of fun. I like the link to Gunmen of the Apocalypse, and I'm glad we got to see the female simulant again. She's awesome, but didn't get a lot of screen time in the former episode. There's also a fun gag involving how Cat wears the same outfit in both episodes. No, I didn't forget it, I'm just saving it for the next Cat video, but that's also a great moment. I love how a civilization of Rimmer clones bears a striking resemblance to ancient Rome. That says so much about him. 
Other than that, I love Rimmer episodes, but I've kind of run out of profound things to say about them. Again, Rimmer is his own worst enemy. That's basically what they all amount to, to some degree. That's not a complaint, though. As I've said before, I always love that hilarious yet disturbing look into Rimmer's subconscious. He's an asshole, but a surprisingly sympathetic character at the same time. Next up is a season 6 finale, Out of Time. See you then. He does operate from a position of total logic and would be fools to ignore his sage counsel. At least let me and Mr. Rimmer go in your place. And what the smeg would you know, bog bot from hell? 